So my foraging book, Wild Plants I've Known and Eaten, covers 42 edible wild plant species that can be found in Essex County, Massachusetts, but many of them are very common weeds and invasive species that grow throughout the Northeast. And the book has recipes and a lot of good advice on how to pick and how to do it in an environmentally responsible and safe manner. So I think you might enjoy it. Okay, so. Uh, dandelions are probably responsible for turning more people off of eating wild plants than anything else. And the story usually goes something like this. Is it'll be spring and you see these fields yellow with dandelion flowers. You say, oh, I heard dandelions are edible. I should try them. So you pick a few leaves, you bring them indoors, put a little oil and vinegar on them. You take one bite, it's incredibly bitter, and you spit it out and you say, yuck, I'm never going to eat a wild plant again. Which is a real shame because dandelions are great if you eat the right part at the right time. So what is that and when is that? Well, as I said, typically people start thinking about eating dandelions when dandelions are making their presence known in the landscape by all the flowers everywhere. And it's really too late to be eating dandelions then. You want to harvest dandelions before the flowers bloom. Now, do you all feel confident that you can recognize a dandelion before the flowers are out there? Yeah. Okay, most people can, so that's good. So, um, so the timing for this is the end of April, beginning of May. When you begin to see the first dandelion flowers out there, it's kind of like the first robins of spring. When they begin to show up, that's when to go pick dandelions. And so uh, I am looking at plants that uh, might have one or two flowers open, but the bulk of the flowers are still unopened flower buds, and they tend to be tucked into the base of the plant, so not elongated on the stems like this yet. But So this is a bud. This is all closed up and it's tucked into the base of the plant where all the leaves are. And that's my favorite part to eat on the plant is the dandelion buds. And the dandelion buds are among my favorite vegetables, period. Cultivated or wild, they're wonderful. They're like a cross between corn, artichokes, Brussels sprouts, and what's the other thing? Corn, artichokes, Brussels sprouts, and spinach. And, uh, and so, so, um, I'm generally not looking at dandelion plants that are on the side of a gravel driveway because it's going to be hard you know, the, to process them. I'm looking for them like on the edge of a cultivated area, like an edge of a farm field, preferably an organic farm field. And there the dandelion plants can get big because you might say, all right, flower bud, I can imagine that, but how am I going to feed my family with this teeny little dandelion bud? And the fact is, on the edges of the farm fields where the dandelion plants get very big, I've been able to find over 200 dandelion buds per plant. And so yes, it takes a little while to pick them off, but um, as long as you're patient, you can find all you need to feed yourself, your family, your dinner guests, whoever you're having over. And so what I'll do is pick a bunch of those buds, bring them home, wash them off, then I'll get a pot of water boiling in the stove, and I'll throw the dandelion buds in, and I'll cook them for 60 seconds. That's it. That's all they need and then uh, fish them out of the water. And you can use them at different dishes then, like uh, stir fries or casseroles or soups, uh, things like that. But I find that, uh, before, what I would advise is that before you add them to anything, in fact, before you put anything on them, before you put it in butter or salt, or anything, just try them plain. And if you want to harvest dandelion uh, leaves, that's the time of year to get them. And so often when I'm picking off the flower buds off the plants, if I find some tender leaves in the center of the plant, I'll harvest those along with the buds and compare them the same way. Okay? But this is a choke cherry. And so if you look carefully on the plant, here's some cherries right here. So um, the way to tell the difference between choke cherry and choke berry is that choke cherry, the cherries are born on these single stalks called the racemes. See, these are the racemes, and there's just a few cherries on here, but ordinarily there'd be like two dozen cherries in each of these. They just didn't set fruit very well. But you see, see how there's one central stalk, and the cherries come off that central stalk. The black cherries do the same thing. Chokeberry, the aronia, has a spray of fruit that come out from a central thing, and then they're each on their own little stalk. So if you go over to that plant that's labeled choke cherry, as I say, it's actually chokeberry, aronia and the berries are displayed with a, you know, a spray where there's like a dozen coming out, you know, each on its own little stalk. Whereas this one, there's one main stalk where the fruits are going off of one main stalk. Are they in the same family? Or no, no, they're, they're not, not, related, not at all. related at all. No. Oh, okay. All right. So, I don't think so. 
Do what either of them choke you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. I like logical questions like that. <laughs> they're called choke cherry or choke berry because they're very puckery. And they make your cheeks cave in. So they're not poisonous. So anyway, so these one of the reasons why I know that this is a choke cherry is because, as opposed to like a black cherry, is the leaves are much rounder on a choke cherry. I'll show you black cherry later. The leaves are much pointier. And also, choke cherry is a naturally shrubby tree. Black cherries can be like 40, 50, 60 feet tall. Choke cherry never gets that big. And choke cherries are actually very common up here in northern New England. So I was actually surprised when I didn't see any yesterday. And it just, this one had eluded me, that's all. Because uh, the, uh, there isn't a lot of fruit in this one, so I didn't spot it. But anyway, choke cherries are ripe before the black cherries, and when the fruit is ripe, it has a maroon color. It's sort of a dull maroon color. And black cherries are, are shiny and black when they're ripe. And these are uh, dull colored and maroon when they're ripe. So, yeah, as the name says, choke cherries are very puckery. So if you just ate the raw fruit, um, you know, there's nothing poisonous about it, but it's the, they'll make your cheeks cave in when you eat it. They're that so. Like when I was a summer camp counselor for 12-year-old boys, they called them puckerberries, and they loved them. You know, but for most, you know, normal tastes, it's a little bit too puckery as a raw fruit. But the, but the choke cherries make an excellent jelly, and it's a great illustration of the fact that most wild fruit makes a more interesting jelly than cultivated fruit because the robustness of the flavor stands up to the jelly making process and makes a much more interesting final product. Like if you compare crab apple, crab apple jelly to apple jelly, crab apple jelly is a lot more character to it than plain old apple jelly. Okay, so um, yeah, so look for these along the roadsides in August here in New Hampshire. And as I say, it doesn't matter where in the state you are, you know, the whole state has them. And they'll be shrubby trees and they're pr pretty common along the roadside. And um, and the fruit's ripe when it's maroon color. Okay? Did, did you talk a little bit about the one mislabeled? Is that also common? Uh, aronia, it's uh, fairly common. It's, it's you know, planted, you know, people that like to plant things plant it because native species people plant it because it's a native species. And some, uh, you know, permaculture type people plant it because because the, the fruit is black, it's high in antioxidants. And so sometimes you see these aronia juice products on the shelves of the herbal apothecary type stores because of the high in antioxidants thing. I don't even have chokeberry on my list because I don't really consider it edible. Um, although I have eaten a, a, a cultivar of chokeberry that I gathered in a park down near where I live that was almost bearable. <laughs> and and actually on the on the slopes of Mount Wachusett in Massachusetts I found some wild chokeberry that, that was actually pretty good. So maybe I should add it to my list. It's actually okay. It's just mo mostly I find it to be really puckery and not very good. Enough. Okay, here, you just take the whole thing. All right, so we got that one? Okay. Oh, let me just teach you this one very briefly, just in case you don't know it. Okay, this is not edible, capitalized N-O-T, edible. But it's a good plant for everybody to know. This is ragweed. Okay, so um, it's not gonna be, it's not gonna bother you now because it's not blooming. The time when this plant is problematic is it's blooming because this is the primary cause of hay fever. And uh, probably all of you are smarter and you know that, that uh, goldenrod, which used to get the blame for it, actually isn't the major cause of hay fever. It's ragweed, which blooms at the same time. And the way we know that is somebody finally had the presence of mind to look at the pollen grains under a microscope. And if you look at the goldenrod power, pollen grains, they're egg-shaped and they have those little dimples, those little depressions on them like a golf ball. If you look at the ragweed pollen under a microscope, it looks like the mace balls that people used to hit each other over the head with in the Middle Ages. They're really spiky, and it's those spikes that irritate your nasal passages. So I'm pointing this out just so if you have this as a weed in your garden and you get hay fever, you might want to yank it out now before it starts blooming. Right. Okay, so pass that to the back so people in the back can see it. All right. So this is a wild lettuce plant. Oh, wow. So it looks kind of like a dandelion on steroids. Yeah, and look, here's pineapple weed right down here. Yeah. In front. But anyway, so um, 
any lettuce, and I don't care how gourmet it is, it's not going to taste good once it does this. You know, and this is called bolting. So even lettuce in your garden will do this if you neglect to pick it. And um, all wild lettuces are edible. By the way, all lettuces, no matter what they are, have milky juice. So when I break a leaf off, a leaf off you can see the, the milky latex of the plant coming out. So head lettuce you buy at the store has it. Every lettuce has it. In fact, the, the botanical name for the family, the, the genus that lettuce is in is lactuca, which means milky in Latin. All right, so, so that tells you that when I break a leaf off and it's not milky, it's not wild lettuce. It doesn't mean every plant with milky juice is wild lettuce. You know that isn't true. Milkweed has milky juice and so on. But if it doesn't have milk, it's not wild lettuce. So uh, as I say, all, wild, all lettuces of any kind are going to be too bitter by the time they get this tall. But wild lettuces will vary in flavor even when they're shorter. So before the stalk shows up, so in, in New Hampshire, this would be up until Memorial Day. The, the plant will have not produced a stalk yet. Uh, they'll just be a cluster of leaves that look like this, and it'll look sort of like an overgrown dandelion. So you have several different kinds of wild lettuce that grow around here. And they're all edible, but there's only one variety I know of that's yummy uh, raw, and that's this one. So this is called the Lactuca canadensis, and the field characteristic to look for is the terminal lobe. See how skinny the terminal lobe is, like a finger? Okay. I will show you a wild lettuce later today that has a broad terminal lobe, very fat like that. And the fat, broad terminal lobes tend to be bitter from the get-go, even when they're small. You could still boil them up and pour off the water and eat it as a cooked vegetable, but if you want something that's yummy raw, and I tend to think of lettuce as something I want to eat raw, uh, this is the one to look for. And look for it before it produces this stalk. So you're just looking for leaves that look like that. And the leaves will taste about as good as lettuce that you grow in your garden or buy at the farmer's market. Or the farm stand. Okay? Is any it? other portions edible? Uh, well, there really aren't any other portions that are yummy. Okay. So, uh, is that what kind of similar? Just growing open oh, that is a good question. Yes. Where does it grow? This is very typical habitat for wild lettuce. It's along a rural road or a woods road. That's where I often see it. So, here are some wild lettuces that have a much broader terminal over the leaf. So once again, I pick the juice off, the white milk comes out on the stem where I broke it off. But you see how fat that terminal lobe is? It's not skinny like the other one. So this lettuce tends to be bitter from the get-go. Okay. Perfectly edible, but just not yummy raw like the other one was. Okay, this right here that I'm holding on to, plus these little saplings right here, like this right here, these are all basswood trees. And it's the genus Tilia. And, um, there's uh, a native species, which is this one, the basswood Atelier Americana, then it's also called a linden tree. And lindens tend to be introduced from Europe, and the one that's most common is the little leaf linden of Atelier Cordata, which is planted a lot as a street tree in cities because it's resistant to air pollution. But they're equally edible the exact same way, so you do not need to know whether you have the native species or the uh, introduced species. So one of the ways to recognize a linden leaf or a basswood leaf is that it's asymmetrical. You see how it's kind of crooked like that? So I look for that. And then there's two uh, edible parts on a uh, linden or basswood tree. It's the young leaves and the flowers. So the young leaves, when they first come out in the spring, are very mild and tender and pleasant tasting, and you can eat them right off the tree. Or you could throw them into salads, or you can do what the English do with them, in England, they call these lime trees, and they make these lime sandwiches, which are like the watercress sandwiches with a crust cut off. And they uh, layer the young linden leaves in the uh, sandwiches, and that uh, makes a nice cooling sandwich. So then, uh, that's the leaves in the spring when they first come out. And now, the edible stage, which is, is a little bit on this plant right here, are the flowers. And so there's a couple of flowers on this plant. So you can see one right here and one right here. And this is a nice typical morphology for one. Okay. So you see the flower buds are just opening up and the flowers are just opening up on this one. You see this little propeller, you know, like helicopter propeller like thing on there? I think that's called a Samara. And, uh, and when the plant forms nutlets later on in the season and these fall off the tree, this will spin around and around like a little helicopter. And I'm guessing the reason for that is the 
plan is hoping that a big gust of wind like what we're having right now will come along just at the right time. And because this is falling slowly, the gust of wind will throw it further away from the tree than if it didn't have the thing and it just went clunk right underneath the tree. Okay? So, but anyway, this time of year is the time to look for these flowers when they're blooming and to make tea from them. And um, I have, I read about this and then I actually heard it myself that uh, in one of the foraging books I have, it says that you can hear the basswood trees before you see them because they're so popular with the bees and the other insects that you hear the buzzing sound before you actually come upon the tree. And that has happened to me. But anyway, so you find these uh, wild ones with the flowers on there or the ones in the city. It's, it's a very common tree in the city because it's planted a lot. And, you, and it's going to have a nice... This one doesn't have much odor to it, but when they're, you know, in their prime, they can scent the entire air of the neighborhood where they are. And it's this wonderful smell. It's sort of lemony, kind of like honey-like smell. And so you make a tea from the flowers, fresh or dried, and the tea has a very pleasant flavor. And by the way, you can put the whole thing in the tea, including this little leafy bit. And, um, and so the tea not only tastes good, but it has two medicinal values. It's soothing to your digestive system and your mental state at the same time. And so this very highly regarded medicinal tea in Europe, uh, France and Germany, you know, everybody knows about it. There. Okay? Well, I, um, you know, it's, 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 I really noticed it with the little leaf linden, the imported one. Oh, okay. But, you know, but I, I, I'm getting a smell from this, just not as strong. But this, but this is fine for making tea. All right, got that one. And and um, the uh, linden trees are relatively common around here. I will see them uh, often along fence rows and in places where there's a little dampness, like along a river corridor, for example. I'm pretty sure I saw it that same place I told you where the autumn olive was going by the covered bridge, the Smith Millennial Bridge. Uh, I believe there's basswood trees there along the Baker River. Okay. If you don't know, it is called Japanese knotweed. Some people call it Japanese or Mexican bamboo, which is inaccurate because it's actually not even distantly related to bamboo, although the dried stalks from the previous year's growth certainly looks a lot like bamboo. But it's in a completely different branch of the plant world. So this plant's related to rhubarb, and it tastes like rhubarb, and I will get into that detail in just a second. So, But first, let me tell you that this plant is at or near the top of the ecological blacklist. The ecologists really, really hate it. And it thrives on disturbance. And we humans are very good at creating disturbance. So when you see it along a roadside, more often than not, it got here from a snowplow. Because it spreads by way of rhizomes as the little roots underneath the ground. And what a snowplow can do is dig into the bank a little bit next to the road and pick up a bit of dirt with a rhizome on there and carry it on the snowplow blade a little while and then it'll fall off and start a new colony. So that's my guess is why we see so much along the roadsides. So that's human disturbance. The other place where knotweed will proliferate is along rivers that are naturally disturbed. Up here in northern New England when the rivers freeze in the winter time and they thaw out in the spring, the ice comes unjammed and pieces of ice will naturally dig into the side of the riverbank and scour it out a little bit and create this bare soil and the knotweed will happily colonize places like that and take that habitat away from the rare plants that utilize that very specialized ecological niche. So, so you'll hear a lot of really bad things about knotweed because of the adverse ecological impacts and it's all justified. Okay, but it is wonderfully edible and it's good for you too, so let me get to that detail. So, uh, the plant's not edible now just because it's too tough. So there's nothing poisonous about it, it's just, it's just in, indigestible. So, but the plant's very obvious now and it will be even more so later when sometimes the plants produce these uh, yellowish white uh, mm. clusters of flowers uh, relatively late in the season. And then, uh, this whole plant will turn this reddish brown color and look like it's dead, but it's just died back. It's an herbaceous perennial, so it's going to come back in the same spot next year, short of a hand grenade or a nuclear weapon. It'll be back. And um, so, 
that's the time to look for it if you want to eat it. So in the spring, you're going to see a whole bunch of these dried up stalks from last year's growth. And in the midst of that, you'll see some things coming up that look like asparagus spears with a cluster of leaves up at the top and these little reddish spots on an otherwise green stalk. And even though the stalks are really hard right now, in the spring when they first come up, they're very soft and pliable with your fingers. So you don't need a knife to harvest it. You can just snap it off at ground level. And so when the shoots are about a foot tall, you can bring them home and steam them. You don't have to boil them and you can for a few minutes and then eat them hot or cold like asparagus. But my favorite stage to harvest the plants are when they get a little taller, and I call this the wild rhubarb stage. So when they're about this tall, so imagine this coming out of the ground. So just lop this off at ground level, lop off the top cluster leaves and all the length of stalk about this long. And I want the stalks to be at least this thick or thicker because I peel the very outer layer off of them because it tends to be stringy. But the knotweed stalks are hollow, so if you peel too deeply, you, all you have left is the hole. You just want to get that very outer layer off. And then you end up with this crisp green tube, which you can eat on the spot. It's tart and juicy, kind of like a Granny Smith apple. Or you can chop it up and use it instead of rhubarb in virtually any recipe calling for rhubarb. So, for example, on the cover of my book, if you notice in the upper left-hand corner, there's a picture of a pie, and that is a strawberry knotweed pie I make every year, and virtually everybody I feed it to prefer it over strawberry rhubarb pie. It's really good. Oh, wow. How, how tall is this? About two feet tall at that When it's that high. Okay. So this is in, in Boston. This is like the first week of uh, May, but it might be the second week up here. And so, uh, anyway, so you might say to yourself, okay, strawberry knotweed pie, yeah, I can imagine that would taste good, because it has strawberries in it. Well, it's not just the strawberries. I have several recipes for just using knotweed as the filling for whatever I'm making that are on my webpage, and they're really good. Huh. And uh, uh, it's the kind of thing I serve at programs like this, like you got the black walnut baklava, but you could have very easily gotten one of the knotweed desserts, and they're also really good. So, uh, all right, so this plant grows everywhere. It's invasive. You can't pick too much of it. Uh, it's delicious. That should be enough to get you to try it. But maybe this last thing, we'll put it over the top for you. So some of you might remember the 60 Minutes episode that aired. This is going back some years ago when they were studying the French paradox. Why aren't all the French people dying of heart attacks with all the foie gras and croissant, all the fatty food they eat all the time? And they determine that it's the red wine that they drink with their meals, and they further determine that it's resveratrol, which is this chemical that's in the grape skins that gets into the wine that must be responsible for that. So they started doing studies on resveratrol, and there's some debate about this, but uh, there's some evidence that resveratrol not only lowers your bad cholesterol, but it also appears to be effective against cancer, Lyme disease, and make you live longer. And so as the news is coming out about resveratrol, the pills are flying off the shelves and millions and millions and millions of dollars of business are being done in resveratrol pills. Well, the commercial source of resveratrol is this plant, Japanese knotweed. And those pills are almost all imported from China, which is totally absurd. Mm -hmm. The balance of payments deficit is bad enough. We ought to be at least supplying ourselves with our own resveratrol. We certainly have plenty of this plant here. We could have, you know, D. Acres brand or NOFA, New Hampshire brand resveratrol pills. And, you know, who knows what wonderful programs you could subsidize with the income from that. So I keep talking this up until I get a pharmacologist on one of my walks who says, I'm going to make this happen. And they'll just do it. Uh, but anyway, so I've been told, so they actually extract the resveratrol from the roots of Japanese knotweed uh, to put it into the pill form. But I believe you get resveratrol just from eating the plant. Okay. Have you tried making it similar to rhubarb? Have you tried making wine out of it? No, and I haven't tried making uh, like a rhubarb jam out of it or things like that. No. Out of it? Uh, but um, it really is okay. once once you have you know harvested the stalks at this height and peeled the outer part, it's really interchangeable for rhubarb and virtually anything you use rhubarb for. So I encourage you to try that and let me know Need how it comes out. Need the same amount of sugar to... Sure, because rhubarb doesn't flavors. have any sweetness to it. The same yeah. thing with knot. Okay. Yeah. And do you like it well enough so that you put some by, please, yeah, or whatever? So yeah, oh, okay, okay. good question. Um, I pay, yeah, and and um, I, I want to answer that question in a more elaborate way than you answer, asked it. Okay, because <laughs> um, I want to address the issue about where do you pick knotweed. Okay, up here in the rural countryside, you have plenty of places like this where... 
unless it's obvious that somebody's targeted and they sprayed it with herbicide, I'm not worried about any other contamination associated with this patch. And so I would harvest it, you know, provided that, you know, I knew the landowner and that it was okay and they wouldn't be alarmed seeing me pick it. Uh, you know, I wouldn't worry about a patch like this, but knotweed, as I say, thrives on disturbance. So, you know, one place where it would grow, where I wouldn't be harvesting it is where it's growing next to the dumpster by the auto body shop. Okay, a place that's obviously going to be exposed to contamination. Okay, so, but knotweed is so common all over the place that you can pick your spots and just wait till you see it in a place that you feel is relatively clean and, and harvested there. So that's one issue. The second issue is, do I like it so much that I put it up and save it for the future? Absolutely. And there's two ways that I do that. Uh, one way is if I'm making a strawberry knotweed pie, I make the pie raw and then I freeze the pie raw. And then when I want to serve it to people, I thaw the pie out and then bake it just before I'm going to serve it. For the other desserts I develop for knotweed, I make it all the way through to the finish and then freeze the finished product and just thaw that out, warm it up, and serve it to people. Okay, it's knotweed, after you peel it and chop it up, uh, it doesn't have a long shelf life in a freezer. You could probably nurse it along for, you know, three or four weeks or so, but after that it's going to start to get freezer burn. And the peeled knotweed stalks, once you chop it up and you put it in your fridge, they'll keep for at least a week. So if you can't, you know, I tend to process the knotweed relatively quickly after I harvest it because it's easier to peel the stalks when they're fresh. And then once I have the, the, the peeled, chopped up stalks just sitting in a plastic bag in my refrigerator, they'll keep for at least a week if you can't use them right away. Okay? All right. Okay, do you like the younger stalks that are like asparagus well enough to do anything with them, or are they just kind of a passing Oh, interest? it's up to you. You know, um, they, they have a little bit of a mucilaginous quality like rhubarb does, and so you might find that off-putting or you might like it. You know, it's just sort of a personal taste thing. All right, so what's that? Do you do anything with the leaves? No, that, well, you know, when, when you're harvesting at the shoot stage, when they're little itty-bitty and the leaves are cold up to the top, I'm not removing the leaves when I cook them up. But yeah, the leaves right now, they're just too tough to use. So uh, let me just, since it sort of came up, let me just add one other thing, okay? If you haven't realized this already, that paying attention to foraging and wild plants that are edible and stuff, it makes you hyper aware of seasonality in a way that we, you know, maybe not so much organic gardeners, but a lot of other people have lost touch with as a culture, is we've gotten used to the, the ability to go to the store and buy anything we want any day of the year we want. We forget that plants have seasons, especially wild plants. Now, I've taught you some things today that have long seasons and some have very brief seasons. This one has a season of about two weeks when it's available. And if you miss that time, you can cheat a little bit by driving north and catching up with the plant where it's not quite as far along in the growing season, but there's only a limited amount of time you can do that. And then you just run out of, you know, it's gone. And so you might look at that and say, well, what a drag. And to me, it's like, it's a classic half full, half empty glass. You can say, this is very frustrating because, you know, if I'm going to eat this, I only have two weeks a year and then the rest of the time I can't eat it. And that's, I don't like that. All right. Well, you know, that's a fact, you know, that's just how these things are. Or you can look at it the way I try to look at it and say, this is like an, uh, uh, an ongoing series of opportunities to celebrate nature by connecting with it with your taste buds. And so it's like, oh, it's not weed season. That's great. And then when that goes by, there's something else that's in season. It's just over. And if you look in the back of my book, there's a spreadsheet that tells you when everything is right. So it saves you a tremendous amount of guesswork. And you just go there and say, okay, it's July 8th. What's right now? And just look at the blacked in squares there and then it saves you a tremendous amount you know, these aren't fake holidays like Hallmark Card Secretary's Day type holidays. These are actual phenological events in the calendar that correspond to the natural rhythms that are out there, whether it's weeds and invasive species or native species. It's still something that has a season to it. And so you could feel constrained by that, or you could look at that as an opportunity to just, you know, be that much more aware of what's going on. Like this. Okay? <laughs> so anyway, for whatever that's worth. All right, so there's two other things I want to teach you here, and then we're going to start hitting up the hill. Okay. So, where was that other one? That's, uh,
So uh, I am going to uh, talk to you about milkweed, but I think I'll wait till we get up the hill to do that because there's plenty on the farm. But the farm uh, did not, uh, as far as uh, I wasn't able to see it, have this plant on it. This one right here? Yeah. Can you all see what I'm holding up here, this flower? You have, you have one. Oh, all right. So anyway, this is called a flowering raspberry, uh, Rubus odoratus. It is a native species. It's one of our showier native flowers. That flower is very pretty and it's rather large. And, um, and it's an edible raspberry, as are all members of the Rubus genus. So this is, uh, besides flowering raspberry, it's red raspberry, like right here. Mm -hmm. And then blackberry across the street over there, and black raspberry, and dewberry, and on and on and on. They're all edible. They're all usable the exact same way. So you do not need to know what exact species you have. So the worst thing that could happen is you see a nice juicy red berry in a plant and you pick it and you eat it and it tastes horrible. It's probably an unripe blackberry or black raspberry. But the fact is that mostly if you see a juicy red blackberry or black raspberry on the plant, you're not going to be able to get it off the plant. The plant doesn't want to give it up until it's ripe. So you'll be yanking on it and it'll be pulling back saying, hey, leave me alone. I'm not ripe yet. So uh, anyway, so the fruit on these, it's going to be uh, red, sort of a pinkish red color, and the pulp on the fruit is going to be rather thin, and it's a little dry, so it's not my favorite of the rupus species to eat, but it's perfectly edible, and people will eat them or, you know, bake with them, whatever. And, um, and one nice thing about the flowering raspberries is that the plants don't have thorns, all right, so that's good. So, um, no, I don't actually think we have one of those. We have a salmon. Oh, okay. Right, so right. You have a western cousin of it. Right. Yeah. So you see that it has these maple-like leaves. Yeah. Okay, another way to recognize it. So this is a native species, and it likes cool habitats up here in northern New England. You have a lot of that. In southern New England, we're seeing it more up in the mountains and cool, you know, shaded areas, but often along roads like this. Okay, so same thing applies to making tea from these leaves. So you can make tea from any of the rubus plant leaves. Uh, fresh or thoroughly dried, apparently when they're wilted, they're slightly toxic, but fresh or thoroughly dried is fine. And once again, the tea that you make from the leaves does taste vaguely like the fruit and it does have vitamin C in it. Um, red raspberry leaf tea in particular has a good reputation medicinally for women because it helps tone the uterine walls and so pregnant women will take it for that purpose. One right here. One right here, one right here, on this side, and then over on this side. So here's one right here, one right here, okay. one right here, okay, and um, you just make sure. Okay, all right, so, so let's pick them, and now I'm going to teach this to you, the Chandra Rose. Okay. So you can go ahead and pick them. Could you wait till they got bigger? Could you wait? They don't get much bigger than this. No, this is about it. All right, so can you all see me and see these mushrooms? All right, why don't we uh, at least take one and pass it to the back? So take that and pass that to the back. Okay. All right. Okay, so um, this is your standard. Chanterelle, this is what's called the common chanterelle, or the yellow chanterelle. And remember I told you about this, the, the uh, putting all the mushrooms on a line at the cluster to one end of those that are virtually impossible, confused with anything poisonous versus those at the other end of the line that even the experts can't look apart? Well, this one is probably about a quarter way in from the really safe end. So it does have poisonous lookalikes, but if you remember everything I'm about to teach you, but how to distinguish this from the poisonous lookalikes, you, you won't mess, mess it up with the poisonous lookalikes. Okay, so first thing to remember is the color of a yellow chanterelle is the same color as an egg yolk or the center stripe in the center of the highway. Mm. All right, second thing is you'll notice that the color of the cap and of the stalk is the same. All right, no difference in color there. Third thing is, if you look on the underside of the cap, and I'll walk around with this so you can all see it, is that uh, although it looks like gills on the underside here, it's actually gill-like ridges on the underside of the cap, but that's less important than the fact that the, the ridges are what are known as decurrent, as it means it runs down the stalk a little bit. Okay, so see right here, so it doesn't yep. stop right at the top, it runs down the stalk a little bit. 
See that? Oh yeah. See that? Oops, sorry. See that? See that? Okay, that runs down this dock a little bit. Okay, good. All right. So, and then these mushrooms grow singly on the ground. So, and when I mean singly is you don't have a whole bunch of them coming up from a central point, like a clump or a cluster. They're just, you know, you might see them close together, but they're going to be individually growing out of the ground. And so if you remember all those things, it's only the common, this yellow chanterelle that's going to meet everything I just told you. All right. So um, two of the common mushrooms that are mistaken for chanterelles this is a mushroom called a false chanterelle. And the difference between this one and that one is that one has orange gills underneath the cap. It's a different color from the top of the cap, and it grows on wood. Then there's also the jack-o'-lantern mushroom, which has decurrent gills that run down the stalk, but it is uh, pumpkin orange in color. Now, this is yellow, all right? The, the, the jack-o'-lantern, the poisonous jack-o'-lantern mushroom is pumpkin orange in color, and they grow in clumps on wood. Do they glow in the dark, too? They do, yeah. But uh, don't use that as a way to, you know, <laughs> right. Don't say, wow, gee, this jack-o'-lantern isn't glowing. It must be okay. No, don't count on that. Okay. Uh, uh, but the, the point is, you know, if you just, those are, the, those are the two species that are most commonly confused with this chanterelle mushroom. And as you see, you know, once you know what I just taught you, you can't get them confused if you just remember those rules. All right? So um, mushrooms fall into three basic categories of edibility. There's edible, good, and choice. Edible means you can eat it, but the flavor is not worth really writing home about, and most mushroom hunters don't get excited about merely edible species. They only typically harvest them if they're not finding the tasty ones. Then there's good, and good is about as good as you can find in, you know, the stores, whatever. And then there's choice, the really primo mushrooms, like the morels and the porcini mushrooms and mushrooms like that. And when mushroom hunters find those, they hop up and down. They get very excited. So most people put the chanterelles, this variety of chanterelle, into that category. It's at least in the good category, if not the choice category. And so there's nothing tricky you need to do with these. They don't need any special preparation method. Uh, a lot of people like to cook them with eggs, uh, so just into an omelet or with scrambled eggs, stuff like that. Um, and uh, in soups is fine, or you know, most ways you'd use a standard straw about mushroom. Um, there is one thing though, is these, the common yellow chanterelle does not dry well. Oh. And so sometimes you'll see those in the stores, dried chanterelles, and it's a joke that they sell them that way and that people buy them that way because they're really tasteless uh, and the texture isn't any good anymore. Now there is a cousin of this mushroom called the black chanterelle, the black trumpet, that does dry very well. In fact, if anything, the flavor gets better when you dry that one. That one tends to come out a little bit later in the year. The common chanterelle is one of the first mushrooms to show up once mushroom season starts. So I can pretty much count on finding these somewhere once it's uh, the beginning of July, July 4th, and so on. So I was not, you know, I'm imp I impressed myself that I saw a place from far away and said there are going to be mushrooms there, and there were, but, you know, I was just going on the clues, you know. If, if you forage for a long time like I have, you know, little clues about little things, like the fact that there's an extra runoff coming off the street, so this is a spot that's going to be a little damper and wetter than the other areas because it's just getting extra water coming off the street here. So as I said before, Mushrooms are water dependent, so that's why I, I, I thought we'd find them here. Okay. Do, do mushrooms need to be cooked, or can they be eaten raw? Uh, I don't eat. Outside? I don't eat any uh, wild mushrooms raw, okay. except for one, the beefsteak mushroom, which is so different and distinctive from anything, and it happens to be one that has a really good texture raw too. But um, uh, the reason why I don't advise people to eat wild mushrooms raw is because some wild mushrooms are actually toxic raw, like morels, for example. Morels are actually oh. toxic raw. They're not safe to eat until after you cook them. Honey mushrooms have to be cooked thoroughly. You can get sick uh, from eating them. So uh, if you just cook all mushrooms thoroughly, then you don't have to remember what ones might be toxic raw and which aren't. And also, uh, if 
there was something on there, you know, some other bacteria pathogen that was on there, by cooking them, you're also reducing the risk that any of that's going to adversely affect you. Yes? Um, you talk about these markers for mushrooms. Are there any trees with these mushrooms particularly? Oh, that's a good question. Um, uh, I, I often see them in association with hemlocks, and we do have a couple hemlocks here, so that, that might be it. Uh, but these, these chanterelles, uh, I look for mossy, damp areas. Uh, in fact, a mushroom hunter I know in the Boston area, when I saw him uh, on a foray with a bunch of chanterelles I collected, I said, where did you find them? And he said, I made a withdrawal from the bank, which means he was picking in a sloping That's area. Sloping and that's often where some, some groundwater will seep its way out toward the mm -hmm. surface mm -hmm. and the mushrooms have access to it. So, all right, well, we, we needn't waste these mushrooms. If you remember, when I was describing about foraging, that, um, that mushroom hunting is a relatively benign foraging activity because all this is the spore dispersal portion of the organism. The actual bulk of the mushroom is the mycelia, the white thread-like mass that's living in the rotting log or wherever it's getting its food from. And as long as you don't disturb that, you're generally not harming the mushroom organism itself. So this is analogous to picking apples off an apple tree. As long as you're not hacking away at whole branches to get those apples, it's generally not. In fact, um, chanterelles are one of the studies they did on mushrooms to see what impact uh, heavy picking would do of chanterelles. And they discovered that, uh, this is a study from the Pacific Northwest, but I think it probably applies here, that um, they detected if anything, maybe a slight increase in the amount of mushroom fruitings in the area that was picked over the other area over time. And it's possible that the mycelia was just aware that the fruiting bodies weren't there anymore and it said, oh, gotta make some more. So having said that, you know, where things can get out of control is where there's rapacious harvesting going on, where in people's eagerness to get even the tiny little baby button mushrooms, they're raking the substrate and disturbing the humus layer to get at the babies. It's not so much true with chanterelles, but other mushrooms like matsutakis that can happen. And, uh, and that can alter the, the, the way that the biology works in the soil, and that's harmful. And also you found another one, very good. So, um, uh, and the other thing is that um, uh, mushrooms are another thing that you're see wild mushrooms you're seeing increasing in restaurant menus. Mm. And I understand that. And, you know, back in the 80s, I used to laugh because you'd see wild mushrooms in a mu menu and it just meant something other than the button mushroom. <laughs> you know, like it might be a criminy mushroom or something like that. And they called it wild because, you know, it was wild with, you know, heavily quoted. <laughs> you know, it was a cultivated mushroom because it wasn't your standard normal flavor. They said, well, it's wild. Well, all right. But, you know, People are picking wild mushrooms and selling them to restaurants and produce things. And I can't really claim that there's, you know, for the most part, at least in New England, I'm not anticipating heavy adverse ecological impacts from that. But there could be, certainly in some areas like around Camden, Maine, where there's some foofy restaurants and there's people that pick those areas. It's very, it's much harder now for a regular person to go out in the woods and find edible mushrooms in the Camden, Maine area because the professional pickers are going to the woods and cleaning it out before they get it. And if you want one of those mild mushrooms, you gotta pay through the nose for it at that foofy restaurant. And that makes me feel bad because uh, that's like ticket scalping. You know, uh, my whole idea of teaching this to you is to enable you to connect to the outdoors yourself, not to read a fancy restaurant menu better. Because I think that the true value in foraging is for us to have this, a bond that most of us already have with the outdoors to even feel that much more connected to it in a visceral, tangible way. And so that's what foraging is about. It's not about commerce and selling things, okay? Once again, I don't want to be sanctimonious about this. You know, if you really need the money, I understand if you need to, you know, pick up some extra money by doing this. But just understand that, you know, I, I really hope that we consider, you know, wild plants to be an opportunity to, you know, celebrate nature in a way that doesn't inhibit other people's ability to do that too. All right. So, okay, but having, having picked these mushrooms, they're not going to do any good, just put right back in the ground here. So, when I pass them on to D acres and you can figure out a way to work that into your menu somehow. Yeah, so there's no reason to leave any. So, yeah, so this, um, it is very likely that four to five days after the next good sized rainstorm that affects this area, there'll be another fruiting of the chanterelles here. So this is this now and by the way, 
<laughs> um, now I'm going to tell you something which is also very nice to know, that for this particular species, this isn't true for all mushrooms, but for the yellow common chanterelle, they're very loyal to the spots where they come up in. So there will always be yellow chanterelles here. What are they eating? They, have a, they probably have a, a mycorrhizal relationship with some of the trees here where they're just all getting along. You know, it's a mutualistic uh, uh, arrangement. So the, the mushrooms are extending the reach of the tree's root systems in exchange for some of the sugars that the trees are producing. Do black trumpets come back in the same place? Yeah, they do too. We had this. This is one of the, what I call the scratch and sniff trees. And so what I'm going to do is just uh, scratch the bark here and then just sniff or taste the place where I've scratched it up. Okay, there you go. So pass that around. Okay, so um, it's from these trees right here with the peeling bark. So the bigger ones and then the skinny one is the same thing. These are yellow birches, same things right here. And what you are sniffing or tasting is oil of wintergreen. And oil of wintergreen is in the inner bark of the trees. That's why I had to take the outer part off so you could uh, smell or taste that inner part. So, um, so yellow birch has it and also black birch has it and where I'm from the black birch is more common than the yellow birch and it has even more oil of wintergreen in the inner bark. And when oil of wintergreen was derived from natural sources it was distilled from black birch twigs and at one time they were cutting a lot of the birch trees down just to make the oil of wintergreen from them. Uh, now oil of wintergreen is made for the most part artificially but as a result there are a lot more birch trees around. So um, fun things you can do with the yellow birches is uh, if you're hiking in the woods and you just want something to chew on as you're hiking it's a fun thing to chew on. Uh, if uh, you're camping and you forgot your toothbrush you could use a birch twig as a natural breath freshener. Um, the chemical name for oil of wintergreen is methyl salicylate, and it is related to salicylic acid, which is the active ingredient in aspirin, and so it does have a pain-killing effect. So if you're hiking in the woods and you twisted your ankle, you could find a birch twig to chew on. At the very least, it would distract you from the pain in your ankle. All right, so now you can make tea, a wintergreen flavor tea, from the birch twigs, and it's something that we could have done today if we had done this as plant number one by the end of the walk today it would have been ready because you can't make it the normal ways you can't put the birch twigs you know pour the boiling water from the kettle on top of them because the oil of wintergreen is easily volatile so it's it's driven off by the heat so if you make the tea that way your kitchen's going to smell great but there'll be no flavor left in your teacup so what you need to do is slow brew it make a sun tea from it and so you take the peeled twigs and the peelings and you put them in a big uh, mason jar or glass pitcher and you fill it up with water and you stick it out in the sun and you let it uh, slow brew uh, ideally for a day or two in the sun and that's how you get a really strong flavored wintergreen tea. Alright? Is wintergreen oil also in wintergreen berries? Yes, yeah, and it's a complete botanic coincidence because the plants aren't related at all. Right. They sure uh -huh. don't look like related. No. no. Alright, so... Um, Does chaga grow on all birches or a particular um, kinds of birch? And I've, have you seen I've seen it here? a lot on yellow birch. And uh, is there any chaga I, here? I don't see any, but I'll, I'll try to keep an eye peeled for it on the way up there. Okay. Yeah. I want to see what that looks like. So anyway, uh, last thing I'll say about birches is you can tap birch trees for sap. Mm -hmm. yes. And it isn't just the yellow or the black birches, it's like the paper birches over there you can tap for sap. Now, of course, they need to be big enough, so, you know, six inches diameter minimum, but ideally larger than that. And you tap them just like maple trees, and the sap flows after the maples have stopped flowing. So up here, that would be like mid-April. Uh, and uh, I tapped some birch trees uh, a number of years ago, and I was getting a gallon of sap in an hour. Wow! So they really gush. But unfortunately, the sap is even waterier than maple sap. Yeah. So you have to boil the heck out of it to get anything. Mm. 
and what you eventually get uh, doesn't have the oil of wintergreen flavor at all. It looks and tastes just like molasses, eh. which is great, but molasses is so cheap and so easy to get at the well, stores, my advice would be just go buy it. <laughs> You're not going to save any time or money making your own molasses from birch sap. Having it. said that, if you were, let's say, camping during the period of the time of year when the birch sap was flowing and you were concerned about the potability of the water supply, the place where you're camping, is you could tap the birch trees and get all the pure, clean drinking water you needed that way. Good. Is that just in the spring or, or very, very early spring like uh, Well, up here it would be mid-April. Right. Do you know anything about birch beer? Uh, I believe it was made from fermented sap and flavored with the twigs, is the traditional recipe. I, I don't know. I, I yeah. just know that uh, Henry David Thoreau in the Maine Woods talks about right. stopping somewhere. And right. Right. I, I believe that's how it was made. And he said it had a lot of twigs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have a mulberry bush, the oh. nursery rhyme type mulberry bush. So one way to recognize it is that the leaves have kind of an irregular shape to them. So they're not all the same, but they usually have these large rounded teeth on the edge of the leaf. So pass that to the back so you can see it. So, and, um, and all mulberries are edible, uh, but the trees come in male and female. And so you're not going to see fruit on all the trees, just the female ones. And, um, and there is a white mulberry and a red mulberry, which hybridize. So it's hard to tell them apart. And basically in the field, you might see a fruit that has purple color to it, and it still could be a white mulberry with purple fruit. So once again, to a forager, I don't really care. Does it taste good? That's what I want to know. And mulberries will vary from tree to tree. Sometimes the fruit, when it's ripe, it'll be insipid, which means it'll be sweet, but there'll be no tartness to it. So um, ideally, if you just want to enjoy the fruit just plain, you want some sweetness and some tartness together. And I have experienced some wonderful mulberries like that, where you get a delicious, sweet and tart together. Usually when the fruit is just short of being dead ripe, so when it's dead ripe, it tends to be quite purpley black. And I like to pick it when it's purple, but not as dark as the color can get on the fruit. And, uh, and then mulberries are great for stuffing your face right by the tree. Um, and you can make stuff from them. You can... Um, dry mulberries. They dry really well in the food dehydrator and then you could add them to granola. Uh, you can, um, you know, make jams and jellies from them. Uh, mulberry makes a very good vinaigrette uh, salad dressing. And so, um, so that's the fruit. So it really just depends on the tree. And, it, and if you look carefully, you can see the ripe fruit, the fruit right here. Mm -hmm. So uh, this isn't quite ripe, but it gives you an idea what the mulberry fruit looks like. And they could be more than twice this big. The way I often find mulberries in the city is I'll be walking or riding my bike along and I'll see this area of the pavement that's stained purple. And then I'll look up and I'll see where the trees are dropping the fruit on the pavement. Uh -huh. So, um, and mulberries are, are ripe around the same time June berries are. So, uh, so at home, that would be like the first day of summer. I could be looking for mulberries and June berries together in the Boston area. So it would be a little bit later up here. But this is a very common urban... Uh, edible tree. It tolerates urban conditions very well. And so in general, I'm not thinking about mulberries when I'm in the White Mountains because it's not, other than when it's planted, you're not likely to run into it here. But here we are. Most so, nurseries carry that. What's that? Do you know, don't, don't, and the many of the nurseries that carry the mulberry? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I bet Fedco does. Yeah, they do. Yeah, that's what Fedco. we got. Yeah, we bought okay. some from exactly. Fedco. All right, some well, there we go. All right, so exactly. now, um, you know how all these wild meats are supposed to taste like chicken, like rattlesnake meat tastes like chicken, and frog legs taste like chicken, and so on? Well, a lot of the wild vegetables are supposed to taste like spinach, and mulberry is one that had that reputation to it, and so I uh, cook some up. And it really does taste like spinach. So this is the young leaves. So on this bushy mulberry here, some of these leaves would be young enough to try that. Um, you know, where I'm finding mulberries is a, a, a vigorously growing bush in the edge of a field, like a, a soccer field. You know, in the spring, all the leaves are going to be young and tender, and then it'll be easy to gather all you need to make as a cooked vegetable. So when I say a cooked vegetable, because one of the foraging books 
uh, I've read. In fact, it was one that was on the counter before, Lee Allen Peterson's book. He says in his book that the raw leaves and the unripe fruit contain hallucinogens. So many years ago, when I was curious about stuff like that, I tried some and nothing happened to me. So it's possible that uh, I didn't have enough or that it's not true. <laughs> but I'll just share that information with those of you that might be Or not, it wasn't enough to make a difference. Oak trees. So, uh, all okay. oaks produce acorns, at least at some point in some years. <laughs> and all acorns are edible, but depending upon the variety of oak you have, you might find them to be, you know, different one way or the other. So in the handout I gave you, which is all about eating acorns, it tells you that um, the oak trees in southern New England can be separated into two basic categories, the hard oaks and the soft oaks. And the hard oaks, like this red oak, have pointy lobes on the leaves. Can everybody see that? How pointy the lobes are on the leaves? The soft oaks, like the white oak, have rounded lobes on the leaves. So. In general, you don't find a lot of white oaks this far north in New England. They tend to, to give way to just the red oaks. And so, um, so if, you, if you're in the region where you have a choice and you can pick the soft oaks or the hard oaks, I generally favor the soft oak species because uh, they usually have lower level of tannic acid in them, which is the bitter principle in acorn that you usually need to leach out to make the acorns safe and yummy to eat. And so um, I'll favor those, but you can eat any acorn. It's just that the, the soft oak species like the white oak, swamp white oak, post oak, chestnut oak, those require less processing to reduce the tannic acid levels to make them yummy. But, but I know people that just use this one because this is the one they have. So it just depends on where you are. It's an autumn olive bush. And, um, you know, there's also, there's, a, there's, there's a, um, a relative of this plant called a gumi, which looks the same, and the fruit ripens earlier, which is why I suspect that this is just plain old autumn olive. But uh, anyway, um, I'm going to find a little uh, twig here to sacrifice to pass out to you to show you what to look for. Okay, so right here, you see all these things right here? All these guys right here, these are the fruits. Mm -hmm. And they're really teeny. Why are they so small? Because they're not ripe until October. Mm -hmm. And so, the, you know, we're in July right now. So they've got all of July, all of August, all of September to be ripe. So pass that around. And uh, but look at the foliage. And you see that it has kind of a silvery character to it. So these are pretty easy to spot. Um, even if you're driving 55 miles an hour in the interstate, where you frequently see them. Well, why would that be? Because the highway departments planted them before they knew this was an invasive species. And so in Massachusetts, it would be illegal for anyone, organic farmer, anybody else to plant an autumn olive. It is a banned plant in Massachusetts. So why is that? Well, you know, the, 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 you know, the ecologists, which tend to be a little militant about this, and I just, I have to respect that. Uh, you know, because they know better than I do about how natural communities work and stuff, that a factor about this tree that might be beneficial for a farm, the fact that it can fix its own nitrogen, because uh, it has, it's like a pea plant, it has the, the, the symbiotic bacteria in its root systems that's adding nitrogen to the soil. Well, if you turn a plant loose in the wild in a natural habitat that is naturally nitrogen deficient, then it can alter the chemistry of the soil and, and maybe reduce the habitat for rare plants that have evolved to cope with the lack of nitrogen in the soil. And so in places where autumn olive is going like gangbusters, like on Cape Cod, where you have all the sandy <coughs> nitrogen deficient soil, the ecologists say this is really bad for the ecology. And so that's why it's on this, you know, uh, banned plant list in Massachusetts, even though, uh, the cat is already completely out of the bag as far as I'm concerned, Massachusetts. We'll never eradicate autumn olive from Massachusetts. Even if we did, you know, spent half the state budget on it over a prolonged period of time, we couldn't get rid of all of it. Uh, so it's just not going to happen. 
So my attitude about eating invasives are if the ecologists remove them from an area, so be it. But in the meantime, if it's around and you can eat it, I'm going to eat it and tell other people about it. You know. So once again, there's no ecological downside to picking all the autumn olive fruit you want. And as I say, this plant goes wild along highways, but you don't have to endanger yourself running out in the median strip to pick it. Okay, you can go to, like, at any interchange that's near a spot where you see autumn off, autumn off will often spread down the side roads, you know, the, the numbered routes, whatever, that, you know, where it's safer to pick it. And often, you know, to build these highways, they'll, they'll have these graveling operations where they're, you know, digging gravel pits and stuff to use for ballast for the road and things like that. And autumn olive love places like that because they're nitrogen deficient. Autumn olive doesn't care. It can grow in a gravel pit. So, uh... So that's where I tend to look for them, is kind of the, the waste places, you know, that are away from the busy roads and stuff like that. Okay, so, as you saw from the picture of my book, when the berries are ripe in the fall, sometimes these plants are so, such heavy berry producers that the branches will bend down from the weight of the fruit. That's how much fruit can be on there. And I'm going to tell you a secret about autumn olive <coughs> is that not all fruit is the same. It varies in flavor from bush to bush, and sometimes it's puckery and astringent, and uh, not very sweet at all. And you can still cook with it, but you just have to add sugar to get it to come out right. But the fruit leather that I made for you that had no sugar in it whatsoever, nothing added, uh, the way I figured that out is I just play Goldilocks, and I go to the autumn olive patch, and usually you're not just seeing one or two bushes, you're seeing dozens of bushes in the places where you find them. So I just go from bush to bush, and I'm tasting the fruit, and I want to taste a nice, sweet flavor. Uh, and that's the ones that make it into my fruit leather. The tart ones don't make it, because they're not uh, sweet just, enough. Uh, is the fruit seed? As one seed. One, seed. one yellowish seed, which, you know, when, when I'm eating the fruit to taste it, I usually just swallow the fruit. I don't spit the seeds out. Yeah, but you can spit yeah, them out if you don't like them. You... I will get to that. Okay. Don't worry. Okay, so, all right. So the secret is when, that even by visually inspecting the fruit, it'll save you a little bit of time when you're tasting them and trying to figure out which ones you might want to eat or not. Because I've discovered that the larger and rounder and redder the fruit, usually the yummier it is. So if you're seeing sort of orange, yellowish, egg-shaped fruit, it's going to be very tart. Okay, so look for the large, round, red fruit, and that will be the best. And when I say large, I'm meaning, you know, like pea-sized, or slightly larger than pea-sized. But because these fruit grow in great, sometimes they call these mountain maples, moosewood, and then uh, there's this plant, which is, I call moosewood, a lot of people call this hobble bush. And it's a viburnum, and it's one of the edible viburnums. One of the reasons why it's called Moosewood, and let's see if I can get this. Okay, is the branches out kind of like moose antlers? Okay, so so this is a uh, viburnum, and I'm happy to tell you there's no poisonous species of viburnum. So they don't all taste good, but uh, there's nothing that's going to get you into any kind of medical trouble if you eat a viburnum berry and even swallow it. So. Uh, I don't have any good examples to show you on this plant, but I will describe this for you so for future reference as you're hiking around or next year you can look for this, is you will see these flat top clusters of white flowers that look somewhat like the elderberry flowers I showed you before. That's pretty typical of viburnum to have its flowers uh, in that type of a flower arrangement, that shape. And then the berries form. And the berries will start out green, and then they'll turn bright, bright red. And shortly thereafter, just like within a week thereafter, they'll turn this uh, purple-black color, and that's when they're ripe. And they'll uh, soften, and they'll be uh, about three-eighths of an inch in diameter. And the flavor is going to taste like uh, uh, prune, uh, with a little bit of a clovey spice to it. It's very nice flavor, and you just nibble on the moosewood berries as you see them in the woods. And um, each uh, fruit has a flat stone in the center, so instead of a pit, it's flat, so it's not round, it's flat. But most people will spit those out instead of swallowing them, which is exactly what the plant hopes that you'll do, help to propagate it. So it's a, it's a fun plant to nibble on as you're hiking in the woods, and this one... Uh, you know, it's very common plant up here, 
very common to encounter it as you're hiking in the White Mountains. And so just look for that ripe fruit uh, in September. That's when you find it. And uh, so this is hobble bush or moosewood. And um, what else is I going to say about it? I can't remember. So, um, just the berries. Then. Yeah, just the berries. Another reason why it's called moosewood is because the moose like to eat the buds on these plants. It produces large buds, and so I believe the moose will nibble on those in the winter time as uh, something to browse on. And so sometimes you'll see the bushes with the tips browsed off, and it's probably moose that are doing that. Um, so the th uh, my understanding is, uh, occasionally I get these questions, today I've been getting these questions, this is available in the nursery tray. I understand from plant propagators that this is a challenging plant to propagate from seed. It has been done, but this is a plant that's generally not available to grow on your own property, but I think it would be a nice choice if you have a shady spot in particular, because not only does it have the pretty flowers and the pretty fruit that's edible, but the leaves, the fall color in the moosewood hobble bush leaves is often really great. So another reason you might want to have it. From the other one you called a what? Uh, well, this is a mountain maple, mountain, mountain maple, which some, sometimes is called moosewood too. So if you want to make the wintergreen flavored tea from this plant, you can do it. Although I think it's a lot easier to do it with a yellow birch. It's faster to gather it that way and potentially less disruptive to the patch. But if you wanted to do it, let's say you're in a spot and you don't have any yellow birch, but you do have a bunch of the winter green and you want to try it, I'm going to show you the best leaves to use for that purpose. So, if you look at the difference between these two, you see how this one is much younger. Okay, so it's the leaves from the younger plants that will have uh, better flavor than the older ones. And a little bit earlier in the spring, sometimes you'll see these when they're soft and reddish and very tender. And those are the best leaves to use if you can find those. But these would be better. So you see the little, these are little uh, flower buds right here. So produce these little white bell-shaped flowers. And then the red berries form later on in the season. Mm -hmm. And the red berries are edible. They're not very sweet, but they do have the wintergreen flavor. So they're fun to eat from that purpose. And the berries often winter over on the plants. Let's see if I can find one for you. How about that? I did. Okay. So here's a wintergreen berry from last year. Okay. So, and I've seen places in New Hampshire, even this time of year, where there are hundreds of the red berries left over from the previous year. So pass that around so everybody can see it. Okay. And, um, and as I say, they're not very sweet, but they do have the wintergreen flavor. Now here in New Hampshire, you have a really fun plant. We have it in Massachusetts too, but you have more of it. It's a plant called the creeping snowberry. And it's in the same, right, it's the same genus as this plant, Galtheria, or Galtheria. This is Galtheria procumbens. The other one is Galtheria hispidula, I think is the name for it. But what it looks like is the leaves have the same basic shape as these, but they're really teeny. They're about an eighth of an inch long. And these things grow in little vines where the leaves are kind of like coming off on either side. So you have a pair of leaves just going along this little creeping vine along the ground. And where I typically see them is growing on stumps or on rocks. And uh, usually when it's a colder, uh, wetter spot than normal. And, um, and I do run into it in the White Mountains, and I'll tell you a place where I found it, that where it had wonderful uh, fruit uh, forming on it, and that is at the base of Wildcat Mountain. And so if you're you know, hiking up from the base lodge and stuff, you don't have to go very far up the slopes where you'll find some growth of this creeping snowberry, and the fruit won't be ripe on it yet, but about a month from now, the fruit will be ripe on it. And the fruit is white, that's why it's called snowberry, and it's the same shape and size and flavor, wintergreen flavor, Tic Tacs. So it's like eating a little candy right off the little vine. What do you think This is tea berry. That's actually Right, okay. yeah. The same as the tea berry dog, right? Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but the, uh, the creeping snowberry is a really fun berry to pick. And you run into it even more as you go further north into like uh, Maine up in Katahdin or New Brunswick. 
uh, Gaspé Peninsula in Quebec and Canadian Maritimes and stuff. So that's a good one to know as you're traveling further north. You know, further south, you're going to run into it a lot less. So we have this little diminutive plant. So pass that to the back. Pass that to the back. Pass that to the back. Okay, and this is a plant called Lil, uh, False Lily of the Valley or Canada Mayflower. Okay, so, um, so typical leaf is like this, okay, and then it's got the fruit forming on here. So it's the fruit that's the edible part, and the fruit is going to be ripe in the fall, and it's going to turn a dark red color, and the fruit will taste like cranberry sauce that's been sweetened with molasses. So it's a pleasant little nibble as you're going through the woods, and... Um, and at least in Massachusetts, I found these fruits still available on Thanksgiving Day. And so if you're out walking off that big turkey meal, you can find some extra cranberry sauce in the woods <laughs> along the trail. So uh, now each of these fruits will have a round stone in the center, which you can swallow or spit out, it doesn't matter. But the pulp that's left on there, as I say, tastes like cranberry sauce sweetened with molasses. So, now, you may want to just nibble these and not eat a whole bunch of them because one of the nicknames for these berries is scoot berries because you have to scoot for the nearest bathroom if you eat too many of them. It has never happened to me, so I think it would have to be a good-sized handful. Uh, but just be aware of that reputation. Two things you might not know. Uh, one thing is that all maple trees have sap to be tapped, not just sugar maple. So like this red maple right here is fine for tapping. Um, and also box elders is actually a species of maple and so if you have a big box elder you can tap that just like a maple tree. And the other thing you might not know is that you can make maple syrup, you can tap the trees, collect the sap and boil it down to make syrup and sugar anytime after the trees go dormant in the fall. So you don't have to wait for Washington's birthday, the traditional day to tap the trees. You can do it in the fall uh, one year, I wanted to make a batch of syrup for Christmas presents, so the first batch I made was November 30th. Yeah. <clears throat> so you can tap the trees in the fall. The sap does flow better in the you know, mid to late winter, but if you need to make a batch early, you can. <laughs> okay? I don't think so. No. You need a little plant with red berries on it. It's right in here. See the red berries in there? All right. So I'm going to bring them out to you. So you can see the plant that the red berries are attached to. Okay, so this is a plant called partridge berry. It's frequently confused with a wintergreen, but after I'm done talking to you about it, you'll see how to tell them apart really easily. Okay, so there it is, very common ground cover. And who wants to help me out here? Who wants to be my assistant? Okay. So tell me what's unusual about that berry. Um, well, I know they have twin flowers. Oh, you're, you're a ringer. I wanted, I wanted an innocuous person that doesn't know anything. Anybody want to volunteer? Okay. I've right, well, given away the secret anyway. Sorry. So if it's all right, it's all right. So if you look at the berries, you'll see they have two little belly buttons on there instead of one. Okay, so pass that around so you can see that. See that on there? Okay, here you go. See that on there? Two little belly buttons instead of one. And the secret is each fruit is formed by two flowers that are fused at the base. So here's what the flowers look like. Okay, so those are last year's berries because the plant is blooming right now. So those are berries that persisted through the winter into the following spring, so they were here for me to teach you the berries. It's very nice. So, and that's pretty common, by the way, is you can pretty much find partridge berries on the plant anytime you see the plant. So, yes, yeah, so this is what the flowers look like. So pass that around. You can see that the two flowers are fused at the base. For every one pair of flowers, you get one fruit. Okay, so that's why it's called twin berry or twin flower, but I call it partridge berry. Okay, so partridge berries are edible. They have virtually no flavor. So I eat them because they're pretty. And so I'll use some partridge berries. I'll put a few on top of a salad just to add visual interest. Remember that when you're making a salad, 
there's often kind of a yin yang balance going on where you don't want too much of a strong spicy flavor and too much blandness. You want a good combination of uh, flavorful greens and not so flavorful greens to balance it out. And so it's fine if you want to put a few berries on there that don't have intense flavor themselves, but they're pretty and they add to the visual interest of the salad. Okay? All right. So by the way, besides the berries, one of the things you could have noticed in the plants that are going around is you see that on the leaves they have that prominent midrib on the center where there's that lighter sort of yellowish color in the center, and the wintergreen leaves don't do that. So just from the leaves you can tell the difference. It grows all over New Hampshire, especially in the White Mountains. So it's a good one for you to know, but there's some conservation issues associated with it. So let me, uh, and, and because from my scoping it out uh, yesterday, I saw there's quite a lot along the road here and in the woods. I'm going to dig up a couple so you get a chance to try it. It's a delicious <coughs> plant, but you have to kill the individual plant to eat the edible part. So that's mm. why I just want to prepare you. This is a plant that you need to harvest with a lot of uh, care and respect and just don't hammer it because it's, uh, it's a native species and, and, and so you want to harvest it carefully. Okay, so the plant is Indian cucumber and here's a nice specimen right here of it. Okay, but there's also one right here, 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 right here. So that's what I check for. Before I think of digging up any, I want to make sure there's a nice size healthy patch before I start thinking of harvesting any. And, and I'm only going to take so much to not in any way affect that, uh -huh. uh, the health of that patch. Okay, so I'm looking for a couple dozen plants minimum before I think of digging up any. But uh, what the Native Americans, I've, to I've been told, uh, do when they're out foraging is when they see a particular plant that they want to harvest, they don't even pick from the first patch. It's still to make an offering of tobacco or some other token of that first patch and then harvest from the second or the third patch they're finding as a way of making sure the plants are able to perpetuate. So that would be a good philosophy to follow, but you know, you get the idea. Okay, so what I'm going to do is dig up a couple of these roots for you. And did anybody bring any water with them? Okay, so those of you that have water, you can help me out by just washing off the roots a little bit, get the dirt off, and then I'll, I'll, we'll slice them up and everybody will get a chance to try them. Because there's a patch big enough here, I think, everybody. So, one of the keys is, is that the plants that are bigger, that are taller, tend to have the bigger roots. And so those are the ones I'm looking at for foraging. So, you don't really need a knife to do this. You just carefully dig at the base of the plant. And uh, the edible root part is not that far down. It's maybe down a couple inches. So just loosen the soil up carefully around the base of the plant. Uh, this one broke. I'll get it. So, all right, so that went like that. So there's your oh, Indian cucumber root. Uh -huh. So it was attached like that. It grows perpendicular okay. to the stem. Okay, so somebody with water, who's got water over here? Can yes. you just uh, rinse that off good? And somebody else with a knife, just you can cut it up into little pieces <laughs> and pass that around. So you can pass this around to get a good look at the okay. plant, and I'll take up one more. So do these plants overwinter or are they annual? No, these are perennials. Okay. Okay, who's got water over on this side? You. Okay, so wash that yeah. off, yeah. and then, uh, okay, so you've cut it up, alright, so you're passing that around, okay, um, so do you need a knife to uh, slice that one sure into little bits? There you go. Alright, and I can pick up a third one by hand if I find them back here. I got a little piece if somebody else wants to cut a little bit oh, the nice, really sharp. Certainly. <laughs> Don't cut you, so. Just th any part of this? Yeah, the root, yeah. Probably don't want to eat the little hairs and a little root hairs, but I won't, won't tell you. Oh, sorry. I'll take that piece. Okay. There you go. 
Okay, go ahead and take the whole thing. All right, so what do you think, those of you that tried it? Tastes like cucumber. It tastes like a starchy cucumber. So edible. That's your that's your reading. It's it's just not really. That well, cool. it's you know it's not bad. Yeah. It's not bitter or anything like yeah. that. Yeah. Thank you. Everybody in here get oh, okay. So some people have likened them to Ooh. jicama. So oh yeah. It's got that kind of a quality yeah. to it. I know what you mean by that. So definitely. Yeah. So all right. Did everybody get some, or do I need to dig up another one? I want everybody to get a chance to try a bit that. All right. Well, we got some slices here if you haven't had any. If you haven't tried it yet, this guy's offering some. slices. Okay. Okay, in the back. All right. Okay, so. All right, if, if, if some of you didn't like it, that's perfectly fine. But usually when I feed this to people, they really like it a lot. And um, so it's, it's a yummy plant. And when you find a good sized patch of it like this, if you dig up a couple, you know, that's okay. Um, but there is another issue I need to explain to you. And may I borrow back one of the plants to talk to you about it. So thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. So, so besides this one being a native species, you want to make sure there's a lot of it before you think of digging up any and, you know, make sure there's a lot left over after you're done. There's another issue about this plant. There is a rare orchid, a listed species that has a very strong resemblance to this plant. And the rare orchid is called the small world pavonia. Oh, yeah. So the botanical name for Indian cucumber is Mediola virginiana. The botanical game name for the small world pagonia is Isotria medialoides, which means looks like Indian cucumber. <laughs> okay, so how do you tell okay. them apart? Well, you can see on these large Indian cucumber specimens, there's what I call this double-decker thing going on, mm -hmm. where you have this first whorl of leaves like this, and then you have another length of stem where a second whorl of leaves forms, and this is where the flowers and the berries form up here. The orchid doesn't do the double-decker thing. It does the single whorl of leaves like that, mm -hmm. and then the orchid flower comes out of the center there. So if you're only harvesting the double-decker Indian cucumber plants, you'll never pick the rare orchid by mistake. Okay? So if you look here on the ground, you'll see some single-stage Indian cucumber plants. Some of this, like this one right here. Okay? Like, if you saw a plant that looked like that, that could be the orchid. All right, so that's why I'm saying just pick the double decker plants. You never pick the protective plant. Are they that's they why it's apart? called medialoides. Okay. Yeah, no, no, no. They really look similar. Okay. Yeah, the the uh, orchid tends to have five leaves in the group, and the Indian cucumber, cucumber tends to have six. But you can see right on this one, there's some variability, yeah. natural variability. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Does the orchid have that white? Um, that off like that. Oh, the little fuzzy bit? I don't know. Yeah, so I wouldn't the use that. The flowers are yellow, right? Uh, are they, are they well, the, 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 you mean on the orchid? Yeah. They're, they're kind of greenish, greenish color, yeah. So, no, the, th the thing to check for is the double-decker thing. That's the easy, easy thing to remember. Uh, and just, just remember to do that. Okay, so, y'all got that one? What sees it? How long is that season? Oh, uh, any cucumbers are always there. Oh, I, and, and so, yeah, so so we have ground nut and any cucumber. Those are roots that are always there. Okay, we have beech trees behind me here. And um, beech trees have two edible parts, the young leaves and the uh, nuts inside the beech nut husks. So... The young leaves, when they first come out in the spring, are edible, but I think the basswood leaves are much better. So I wouldn't eat these. But I just mentioned that because you're going to see it in the literature. But the other thing that's edible are the beech uh, nuts, and they live in a husk that looks like this. So pass that to the back so people in the back can see that. Okay. And here's another one. Okay. So in... In the late summer, uh, the trees will begin to produce uh, this current year's crop of beech nuts. And they start out with these husks that are green and close really tight and really hard to get into, even if you're a bear or a squirrel. 
Uh, why would the nut be doing that? And it's got this sort of husky, you know, kind of almost uh, spiny outside. Because the tree is trying to discourage you from eating the nuts before they're ripe. When the nuts are ripe, they fall out of the husk like this and they fall on the ground. And so they're pyramidical shaped. And a lot of times, including me, people have been frustrated because they'll see all those pyramidical shaped things in the ground and they'll open one after the other after the other and they're just not finding any good nut meats inside. It's because the squirrels and chipmunks have been there before you and gotten all the good ones. Because they can smell what's a good one or not and they don't bother with the bad ones. They didn't even open them up. So, but if you time it right, uh, like a nice windy day like this, if, if the beech nuts are ripe, a wind like this would be knocking the fresh ones down on the ground and you could uh, gather them. So if your timing is right, it's good. So on the pyramidical shaped nut, if the sides of it bow out, it looks swollen, the nut inside is gonna be good. If they're all caved in, the nut inside won't be good. And so a beech nut tastes kind of, it's, it's nutty and it tastes a little coconutty. It's very pleasant flavor. And I've heard that the most effective way to gather beech nuts is to find a tree out in the open. It's kind of like, you know, the hazelnuts. The more sun it gets, the better it is. And spread some tarps or blankets underneath the tree and then send an agile friend or family member up into the tree to shake the branches. Oh. And then the nuts will fall off the tree and carpet your tarps and then you can collect them now. Okay? But when did you say the tree? Like September. September. Yeah. So there's trees that look like this. Okay. And this is called uh, Clintonia borealis, is the botanical name, or it's called corn lily or blue bee lily. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I'm already seeing some this year, but this is the plant that produces those beautiful, they look like, you know, costume jewelry type blue bee berries mm -hmm. on these stems that are about 10 inches tall. Mm -hmm. So none of that is edible. The edible part on the Clintonia are the young leaves. So it's actually too late in the season for these leaves to be yummy. But when the leaves first come out in this plant, they're very tasty. They taste like an outside of a cucumber. Mm. It's a very pleasant flavor. But it really needs to be more like Memorial Day when I'm harvesting them. So this time of year, it's too late. But so if you're up here hiking around in the woods in the spring when the leaves are like two or three inches tall, that's the time to gather them. And they're very nice. Okay, so the leaves aren't yummy, especially after the whole bloom and begin to produce these berries. The leaves, you know, they lose the nice weight. This is called Clintonia or Blue Bee Lily or Corn Lily. Are these the from the... Are these the... That's the false lily of the valley. Yeah, the difference are these leaves are much bigger. And they're smoother. So, no, they're, they're, they're related plants. So the leaves are kind of similar. You know, you'll know that you have the right thing if it's a Clintonia, if you bite into it and you get the really wonderful cucumber flavor when they're small in the spring. Yes. And will the flower have started sprouting? No, no it's before, before the flower is up. Yep. I was hoping maybe we might find an edible mushroom in the trail for you, and instead I found two, one, three examples of a non-edible mushroom. This is in the genus Russula arusula, R-U-S-S-U-L-A. Very common uh, mushroom genus, and uh, the red ones are way at the end of the line. The experts can't tell them apart, end of the line. Okay, mm -hmm. and among the red ones is a mushroom called the Russula russula emetica. Like emetic means like you puke. <laughs> okay, so the general rule for these Russula mushrooms is don't ever eat any red ones. I've eaten one that's kind of reddish purple that smells like shrimp that I've collected in Colorado that was really good. It tastes like shrimp, but that one's much less common here. So in general, stay away from the red ones. There are some green ones and yellow ones that are edible. But this falls into the you know much more challenging end of the spectrum. One of the challenges with Russo is I pass that around so everybody can see. You see that this mushroom is one of the true guild mushrooms. And guild mushrooms are responsible for more than 90% of all mushroom fatalities. And so some beginning mushroomers just stay away from the guild mushrooms and they're avoiding the vast majority of the problems. Uh, but anyway, most mushroom hunters don't bother with Russulas. In fact, they have a lightly disparaging acronym for these. They call them JARs, J-A-R, for just another resort <laughs> when it's eating on the trail. And so um, one of the ways to recognize these Russos is they look kind of like little Hummel figurine-type mushrooms. <laughs> they look like they're made out of porcelain. 
and uh, and when you smash them up, they smash up in lots of little bits like that. Okay, so they they they, they break up into many little bits. So that's another way to recognize the rustle of the roots of the mushroom. So for those of you that just arrived, this is not an edible mushroom. Okay, all right. It's, it's got the two little teeth at the base. Oh. Okay, so yeah. right in here, grab one. Look for the two little teeth at the bottom. There's a patch over behind me here. We have plenty of it. Okay, good. He has plenty of it. Okay. I know what it is. All right, and um, so it looks like, see, it's, it's shaped kind of like a spear with the two little teeth at the bottom. So this is a plant called sheep sorrel, S-O-R-R-E-L. It is a close cousin of the French garden sorrel. You can use it the same way to make a sorrel sauce from it, a sorrel soup from it. And if you nibble on it, you'll see that it has a nice sour flavor. So is it bad to eat a lot of that? Because of the... I'll get to that. Okay. So uh, <laughs> anyway, um, so this is what the flowers look like. They're really teeny, and you can barely see them when there's just a couple plants together. But if you're driving like along the interstate, you see these areas of grass where it's all reddish brown in color. It's a whole bunch of the sheep sorrel blooming together and making that color when all these flowers get together. So um, yes, yeah, so you can eat this raw or you can cook with it. Um, now the chemical responsible, the sour flavor in this plant is a chemical called oxalic acid, which is not good to eat in huge amounts. Like if you ate a big cell bowl full of just this plant, it could inhibit your body's ability to uptake calcium. It could irritate your stomach lining, but there's no reason to be unduly concerned about the chemical because it's present in a lot of conventional vegetables like beets and spinach and rhubarb. So as long as you eat it in moderation, it's perfectly fine. Number one, right here. So this is a plant called sow thistle. And this is a kind of a prickly sow thistle, but you have the other kind here too. And uh, this is related to dandelion. So even though it's prickly in the raw state, uh, when you boil this plant up, the prick prickeriness goes right away. And the botanical name for this plant is called Sanchus oleraceus, which means translated from the Latin, good enough to be a garden vegetable. <laughs> so it's really yummy. It's better than dandelion greens, but not when it's tall like this. When it first comes up, so way before the flowers form, and these flowers are gonna look just like dandelion flowers, by the way. So when the plants are small, I eat the leaves raw, and you know, and I don't, I'm not a, 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 don't have a very high tolerance for bitter, and even that is fine. Oh, by the way, this is going to have milky juice coming out. Okay, so, uh, so is that you know, like dandelions have milky juice and so on, and so, um, so this prickly one you might not enjoy as a raw plant. The the one that's not spiny, you might like better, but that also grows here too. But either way, they're edible, uh, cooked. And so I would just boil them for like 30 seconds, and that's a very nice cooked vegetable, better than dandelion greens, and it also is high in vitamin content. So that's the sow thistle. Nice to see sow thistle growing around actual sows. Very fun. Okay, so then um, right here, I keep seeing other things I have to teach you. Right here is called curled or curly dog. So it's called that because the leaves have these undulating leaf margins, and so this one is in the same genus as the sheep sorrel I just taught you. So this uh, can be used like the French garden sorrel, though it's got a bit of a, a bitter tinge to it. So I tend to blanch it briefly, like drop it into boiling water for about 20 seconds, and then um, uh, use the leaves. And it's really good in spanakopita, the Greek spinach pie with the phyllo dough and the feta cheese. You use the blanched curled dock leaves in that recipe. So. The leaves are best in the spring when the plant first comes up, oh, so way before up. you see curled these flower up. heads and these seed pods. So just curled look for the curled up leaves like this, and that's the ones you use. After this plant goes to seed, this whole thing turns brown and it looks dead, but it's just gone dormant. And in the fall, young leaves will come up again, so you get a second shot at gathering oh, nice. the young leaves. This plant also has another... Oh, so these leaves are an antidote to the sting and stinging nettle. So if you get stung by a stinging nettle, you just take a curled dock leaf and scrunch it up and rub it on the place you got stung by the stinging oh. nettle and it helps make the sting go away. Later. <laughs> okay. And um, I could have needed that. Yeah, and they often grow side by side. And uh, if I had been successful in yanking this root out of the ground, you'd see it's a big yellow tap root, and the medicinal name for this plant is yellow dock, and the root is the medicinal part. And there's several values for the root, but the one I'm most familiar with is it helps the body assimilate iron better. And so pregnant women, anemic people, will take it for that purpose to boost their iron levels. Okay, 
So, uh, there's so many other things here. But let me just do one other thing that's right here. And that's uh, this plant right here, and right here, and right here. It's going to be a challenging plant to end on, but anyway, I will do it. Okay, this is evening primrose. And uh, evening primrose was also growing along the um, um, uh, road. Um, and, uh, and there it was the second year plant. It was already this tall and getting ready to produce the yellow flowers. Well, this is a biennial, so it has a two-year life cycle like the wild parsnip. And the first year, you just see a whorl of leaves like this flat along the ground. I'm looking at this white midrib in the center. See how it has a white midrib there? So that's sending energy down to this taproot, and it's going to be hard to yank on it in this gravelly soil here. But the root is going to look like a carrot, but it's going to have a pink coloration near the top of it. And so that winters over, and then the second year it's going to produce that long flower stuff. Okay, so to eat the evening primrose root, you want to harvest it at the end of the first growing season, the beginning of the second growing season, because once again, by the time the plant's tall, it's used up the goodness in the root to produce the flower stuff. So, so far, the best way I've found to use the evening primrose root is to grate it up and to make pancakes with it, like mm -hmm. potato pancakes. So you can take whatever po potato pancake recipe you use and substitute an equivalent amount of the evening primrose root for the, uh, pancake, for the potato, and it should come out fine. Mm -hmm. Okay? All right, well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hope you had fun, you know. Uh, yeah, I didn't get to at least two dozen plants that are so my foraging book, Wild Plants I've Known and Eaten, covers 42 edible wild plant species that can be found in Essex County, Massachusetts, but many of them are very common weeds and invasive species that grow throughout the Northeast. And the book has recipes and a lot of good advice on how to pick and how to do it in an environmentally responsible and safe manner. So I think you might enjoy it.